Dear Father, thank you, Lord, for our time this year in study. It's been a, another blessed time, many weeks, Father, of looking at your word and doing it in a new way by the counsel of your spirit with friends around us, enjoying fellowship and prayer, the many things, that, the, the core things that define life in the body of Christ, Father. You've been so kind and gracious to give us an opportunity in the middle of our week to have that among friends. And, Lord, we don't take it for granted. You've been kind to give us this for 10 years now uh, in this place. And that is something uh, remarkable considering how much things change in our world today and how quickly things move. Uh, Stability in any form seems rare, Father. We thank you, Father, for this stability and for the grace that's imparted on so many over the years. And I pray, Father, it's still in your desire to see it here for many years to come. And, Father, we just want to keep being faithful with what you've given us. That is the time, the place, the relationships, and most of all, Father, attentiveness to your word. We know, Father, it will be rewarded in many times over in what we will do for you and how we live for you, how we understand you better, how we prepare for a kingdom where we will serve you forever. Thank you, Father, for the chance to come to know these things even now. And in the stories that we'll study in David in the weeks to come, Father, Let us see a man whose heart was for you in a way that causes us to consider our own heart and perhaps, Father, to make changes as we need so that perhaps one day someone could say something similar of us, that we lived with a heart for you. For I know, Father, that's why you recorded David in your word, because this man who lived so long ago is uh, your measuring stick for how men can live to serve you now. And uh, he himself, Father, in striving to measure up to Christ as we all do. And Lord, thank you for the example. And give me the words that you choose to speak through me for their benefit, Father, tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, David is anointed. Saul is afflicted. And that's where we left last week. The Lord had brought these two rivals together for a time, for a season, for the purpose of getting one ready for rule while chastising the other one as he begins to end in his rule. So you're going to watch David's prominence and his strength and his notoriety begin to increase now over a series of chapters. And in the meantime, Saul's fear and Saul's jealousy and his paranoia is going to likewise increase in response to David. And this is all according to God's will, as God intended. It's part of bringing about this transition of Saul's monarchy to David's monarchy. Last week we saw David's rise to prominence begin in a fairly modest way as a musician in Saul's court, the court of the king. He was a skillful musician, we're told. His mother forced him to play violin from a very early age, like my mother did. Only the difference is that David paid attention and had talent. David was a skillful musician, we're told, and what God did with that is use him to soothe Saul's anguish, which came as a result of the tormenting of that evil spirit that God sent Saul. So the Lord would drive the evil spirit away temporarily whenever David played, and in doing so, he created this strong bond between these two men, where Saul felt this really strong affinity for David's skill for obvious reasons, but that was something God put in place so that these two men would get to know each other and God could use that relationship. Now, in addition to playing music, we will learn tonight that David continues to tend sheep for his father, Jesse, which tells us he's still relatively young. He hasn't been in the court now for very long. So the people, Saul included, aren't giving David much thought beyond his musical ability at this point. So keep that in your mind. David is a relatively obscure young man doing a small job in the king's court, one that Saul greatly appreciates in moments But beyond that, he's not made much of an impression as yet. But the Lord has great plans for him. We know that. And what the Lord knows of David's heart, he's ready now to expose to the rest of the people of Israel. He wants the people to begin to know David as God knows David. What God needs, though, is for David to encounter an adversary who's mighty enough that it would gain the people's attention were David able to rise above it. And so this is the story today, the day that David meets Goliath. One survey of the most recognized stories in the Bible placed the story of David and Goliath second only to the account of Jesus' birth. Virtually any child that spent any time at all, I would think, in church or in Sunday school has heard the story and probably drawn the pictures with their crayons. In fact, virtually every culture of the world 
can identify David and Goliath. And people across the world, secular, religious, or whatever, they know the term David and Goliath. It's become a metaphor that describes victory by an underdog of an overmatched opponent. That term, David and Goliath, gets thrown out in sports all the time, in politics, in business. It's just the simple story of triumph over impossible odds. And it never grows tiring. It never loses its appeal. Perhaps why this story has rung true for so long. In the Bible, though, the story is a lot more than just the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. It's a story of a miracle done to validate the anointing of a future king. It's a test for Saul's heart. And in in general, it becomes a launch pad for what God's going to do in raising David up. And the story begins with a stalemate. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Soko and Ezekiah in Ephes Damin. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. So the enemy of God, the Philistines, come up to attack Israel. Now these people, the Philistines, we've seen them before. Remember, these are the guys who had that super close encounter with the ark that left a a very strong memory for them that they'll never touch it again. They occupy the coastal plain of Israel. So north to south, they're on the far western edge of the nation. They live predominantly in those five cities that we looked at before. And we learned that these five cities operated more or less independently. There was a king in each among the Philistines. And for the most part, they stayed in their part of the land, in the coastal plain. But they were constantly warring with the Jews to some degree or another, seeking to occupy the high ground, which Israel had. There was always some friction over that border. And from time to time, you see the Philistines encroach up into the hill country to attack and try to claim land from the Jews, and the Jews would retaliate and push them back down and so on. This has been going on for a while, all the way back to the time of Judges. You saw this going on. And throughout that time, the Lord has been using the Philistines as a blunt weapon of sorts to discipline the nation of Israel when he felt he needed to. So now, once again, at this point, we see them encroaching into the hill country of Judah, in the tribal area of Judah, in a little town, near a little town called Soko in the Valley of Elah. Soko is a town at the eastern end of the valley, while Azekah is on the opposite end of the valley. The valley runs east-west. So you have cities that dot each end of it, and the Philistines are camped somewhere in the middle of the valley, past Azekah towards Soko. And Soko is in the land of Judah. So they don't want, the the Jews don't want the Philistines to get any further west and into this city. So Saul brings his forces into the valley to stop the Philistine advance, and these two armies soon become entrenched in a stalemate in this valley. I've been in the valley, I was there this summer, and many of you have probably been there if you've gone to Israel. It's not very big, it's not very wide. And they have become entrenched. And the way this happened is whenever you're fighting a battle, particularly hand-to-hand combat, you're going to want high ground. High ground gives you a physical advantage over the ones who are below you trying to attack. You you have a, a position of advantage there. So armies seek the high ground. So the Philistines ran up one side of the valley. They ran up the mountainside on one side of the valley. That would give them the high ground. If the Jews tried to attack, they'd have to be attacking going uphill, which would make it much harder. But naturally, the Israelites didn't want to be vulnerable in the low parts of the valley, so they had to claim high ground too, so they went up on the other side where the Philistines weren't, and they claimed the high ground on that side of the valley. Now you have these two armies standing on hillsides opposite each other with a valley between them, neither willing to yield the high ground in order to advance into combat for fear that they would lose the advantage if they did that. So now you have a stalemate, two armies looking at each other with a valley between them and nobody doing anything. So this goes on for a long time, as you're going to find out. The Philistines, though, were Greek. They had Greek origins. They came centuries earlier from Greece, from Macedonia. And so they followed Greek practices, Greek traditions in warfare. And one of these Greek practices was that you could settle a stalemate of this kind 
by conducting a single fight between two men who were called champions. Um, each army would select a man who would go out and engage in a fight to the death, and whichever man won that battle would determine the winning army for the entire battle. Homer records this same tradition in the Iliad when he records the battle between Hector and Achilles. That's an example of the battle being settled by two guys. In fact, the word in your Bibles, I don't know if your Bible says what mine does, but mine uses the word champion in verse 4. But actually, the Hebrew word behind that is just the word ish, man, in Hebrew. But the translators of my NASB chose to use the word champion there to acknowledge the Greek tradition. The champion for the Philistines is a man named Goliath. His name means to be made a captive, which I think is prophetic in this case, for where the battle is headed. More importantly, he is a ringer. He is literally a giant among men. He stands nine feet tall, or 2.75 meters, though in the Septuagint and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in both cases, he's said to be six foot six inches, not nine foot. And honestly, six foot six inches sounds a lot more reasonable and likely. Now, that doesn't mean he couldn't have been nine feet. But he doesn't have to be nine feet for the story to have all the same impact because the average height of someone in the Middle East in this time was probably close to five feet. So in any case, he's standing much taller. And it's not just his height, it's also his strength because it says he has armor that weighs 125 pounds. That's the weight of an average man of this day. So he's like carrying another man on your back everywhere you go. His spearhead alone, that's the piece of the metal that sits on the end of the stick, that alone weighed 15 pounds, which is like the weight of a shot put. Imagine carrying that thing around on the end of a stick and still being effective with it in battle. That's a lot of strength. So Samuel gives us what is actually one of the most extended descriptions of any person in Scripture in the Old Testament. He gives this extended description of Goliath just so that you and I have this full picture of what Israel was facing were they to take up the challenge of a champion. This is a man who's a freak of nature in his day. He's not some supernatural creation. There are those who would try to explain this guy as a remnant of the Nephilim, for example, but they were all destroyed in the flood. He is simply an outlier genetically. Statistically speaking, he's, he's out on the edge of the curve. If he were alive today, he'd have been drafted by the NBA. Right? Or he would have traveled with a circus. But this is no game now, right? This is warfare. And this guy is easily capable of killing anyone in the army of Israel who would have come down to, uh, to challenge him, right? Which is why the Philistines trot him out into the valley and start to challenge the Israelites. Verse 8. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in the battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So in keeping with the Greek tradition, he walks out in the valley from the mountainside, across the valley. So he's very exposed right now. This is a part of the tradition of wars. You don't attack a guy who's coming out under these terms. He's not your threat at that point. He's, he's trying to conduct business. And he asks the army, why are you all lined up to battle? You know, we don't have to do that. You don't all have to enter into battle. Why don't we settle this just one-on-one? -on -one? I'll be for my side. You send me somebody down from Saul's army, he says. We can just settle this mano a mano, and there's no need for the rest of us to have to get our hands dirty. Then he promises, if I die, then all of us are your slaves. But of course, if it goes the other direction, you'd serve us. The point he's making is that either way, only one guy has to die. Not all of us, in other words. You'll live, but you'll be a slave, but that's better than dying. That's the bargain. And that's how the Greeks saw warfare. They saw it as a compromise of that sort. It'd be better to live as a slave than to die. We know this initial offer was met with silence because in verse 10, he has to repeat the offer. He says, it says particularly, he says in verse 10, he defied the ranks of Israel. The word defined Hebrew means to insult. It's the same word for insult. So it's probable that I, Goliath is hurling insults at Israel, in effect daring them to send someone down to fight him, provoking them to the fight, because obviously he's confident that he'll win no matter who they send. Now, as you notice at the end of the last passage I just read, who is standing among the troops of Israel but Saul himself? And do you remember the description of Saul? This is a man who stood a full head taller than any other person in Israel, we were told by Samuel. 
So imagine this army gathered with one guy standing good six or eight inches above the rest, not able to really hide. He stands out like a sore thumb, literally, in this crowd, right? So if there was one guy in the army of Israel who would have been logically chosen to be sent out against a six or nine foot guy on the other side, it would have been Saul. He's the only one who has the stature to even compete at all with this other guy. And Saul knew that. Who wouldn't have known it? Never mind the fact that Saul was the king and a warrior who had previously defeated stronger enemies in past engagements, right? So he's the logical choice. But the problem this time is Saul lacks the spirit of God. And so he has no courage, no spirit-induced courage, no confidence to enter this battle, nor does he have any reason to think that the Lord's going to grant him victory. He's living in the flesh. So all he sees is this superior foe taunting him, and he's got no belief in himself that he could do anything to stop it. And yet, he's feeling a pressure, undoubtedly, from amongst his troops to rise to the challenge, and he doesn't. He doesn't because he knows he won't survive if he did. But it's an awkward, to say the least, an awkward moment for him. So he is described as dismayed and frightened. And not just simply because, as the rest of his troops are, he might lose a battle. He's more concerned for his own skin and the fact that he's on the spot. He's the leader. And if the king is frightened into paralysis, then certainly the troops with him are going to feel the same way. So here you have the army of Israel just standing their ground, not willing to take up the challenge, looking foolish, of course, because you have this one guy just taunting them and saying nasty things about them and they won't do anything. And by association... God, the God of Israel, appears to cower in the face of the threats of a pagan. That's implicit in this moment, because Israel had always gone to battle under the banner of their God, as pagans did in their case as well. And here you see the gods of the pagans mocking the God of Israel and nothing coming of it. So it's by association the God of Israel appears to be weak. And the army's stuck. They can't attack, or they don't dare do so, but they can't retreat either. They're on, they're on the side of a mountain. So they just stay there. But they can't stay there forever, not with Goliath taunting them the whole time. So something's going to have to give. Verse 12, Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. The three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and the second to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. The Philistine came forward morning and evening for forty days and took his stand. Then Jesse said to David his son, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these ten cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand and look into the welfare of your brothers and bring back news of them. For Saul and they and all the men of Israel are in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning and left the flock with a keeper and took the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistine drew up in battle array, army against army. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with him, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines. And he spoke these same words and David heard them. So once again, Samuel, in a brief way, introduces us to David again, and more specifically to David's father, to Jesse and to his family, saying Jesse's a man of eight sons, and he's a man nearing the end of his life. He's old. Samuel gives us this detail again to explain why David is still at home with the flock at this point in the story. Because earlier, we were told David had become an armor bearer for Saul and been brought into commission, basically, as a permanent part of the king's court in that role. So you might have expected him to either be in the court or to be with Saul playing music or in the army or somewhere. But instead, we find him back in Jesse's home. The reason is because Jesse's old and his three oldest sons are all in the battle. Therefore, the family needed David's help with tending the sheep. So while Saul was away at battle, David goes back to Jesse's home in Bethlehem to serve the family. Meanwhile, 40 days of taunting has come and gone now with Goliath. Now, 40 days is a long time to remain encamped in the same place 
under threat of war. When you didn't plan to be in camp there necessarily to begin with, you came intending to battle, and now it's 40 days, and you're just sitting on the side of a mountain. Bivouacked under those circumstances is no fun. And it had to be not only miserable for the army because of their circumstances, but it's made all the worse by Goliath's daily taunting. And of course, an army needs to be fed while they're sitting on the side of a mountain. So the people of Israel apparently are mobilized to support their troops. They put yellow ribbons on the tree and they've got bumper stickers on their cars. And Out of concern for his other sons, Jesse tells David, go to the troops and I want you to bring grain, bread, and cheese. Basically, he's sending cheese sandwiches to the troops. Once again... David is seen as a servant bringing bread to the king. It's interesting how this is the second time he's come to Saul in somewhat similar circumstances. And Jesse also wants David to come back with news of the battle, which I'm sure everybody was trying to figure out when's this going to end. So then, David arrives. The army, as he is arriving, is moving into battle. It would appear as though Saul has tired of the stalemate and has decided it's better to forfeit his position than to withstand this barrage of insults day after day. So it looks as though they're actually getting ready to move when David shows up position for the fight and in response the Philistines have positioned themselves for the fight as well and into this tense situation David drops his baggage runs right to the front of the line where his brothers were stationed with grilled cheese sandwiches seeing the armies preparing for the fight and seeing David run under those circumstances without hesitation right to the front lines that's the first indication you have of some of what goes on in David's heart the fearlessness of David he seems completely at ease with the prospect of encountering God's enemies. He's not concerned at all about being in the front ranks of an army preparing to go into battle, despite the fact that there's obvious danger, and he's a young kid, and he has no armor and no training. What explains that? It's not based on nothing. In other words, it's not absent knowledge or thought. David understands who he serves. He understands who God is. He understands how God works. He understands how God views Israel. And that's his source of confidence, as you'll see later in the story. So David reaches the front lines, and just as he comes there, Goliath comes out for one of his daily taunts. And he comes out, speaks, and David hears. Verse 24, when all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? The people answered him in accord with this word, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Timing is everything in this story. So David has arrived at just the right moment and hears just the right things, both from Goliath and then also from the soldiers around him. And of course, none of this is happenstance. Everything that's happening right now is happening according to a script God wrote long before. And David is seeing it play out in front of him, and he's being introduced to these thoughts in just the right way. Having watched the Jewish army demoralized for 40 days by Goliath's taunts and and so on, now the Philistines decided, oh, I know how to get this battle working our way. Let's just shuffle Goliath out in front again, put him in the front of the ranks. That'll unnerve the other side, and we'll just have that much more advantage in battle. This is a way of, of helping set up the battle in such a way that the other army doesn't have the will to fight and that they will retreat. Sure enough, the sight of Goliath leads the men of Israel to break ranks, at least to some degree, and begin to flee or to retreat back. And they explain their actions, interestingly, by pointing to Goliath and saying, have you seen this guy? So if there were anyone there questioning their bravery or choice to leave the rank, they just responded by saying, you'll understand if you take a look. And then some, in the course of that, repeat The offer that apparently Saul had made at some point and had been circulating among the armies, that if someone would defeat this man, Saul would bestow great riches upon him, give him a daughter, and that the man's father's house would be made free, which means that that house, the whole household, would live tax-free in the kingdom for as long as he was alive. Nevertheless, that hadn't brought anyone, obviously, to battle or be motivated to go after Goliath. I mean, what good are all those riches if you're dead, right? That's probably the way the math was working in most people's heads. David arrives. He knows none of this, obviously. But he hears of what Goliath is doing, saying, I guess I should say. Then he's caught up in the melee that follows with the retreat or with the the confusion. And then he starts to hear people saying, if only we could find someone who's willing to take this on. I wonder if they were repeating it because they were still hoping to recruit somebody at the last minute. Does anybody want to take this on? Remember, he said, lots of riches, daughters, you know, somebody please. David hears this, and I love the way he questions it in verse 26. He says, what will be done? As if to say... You get all of that for killing just one Philistine? It has that tone to it, doesn't it? 
And not because David thinks this guy is a small matter, but because he knows who God is. He says, who is this guy that he would taunt the armies of the living God? It's incredulous to him that the reward could be so great for something that's going to be a no-brainer. And so he's aghast at this, and he's not sure that it's true. He wants confirmation that it's true. It's really an indication both of David's maturity and his wisdom. And it's easy to read this in an opposite way. It's easy to read it as immaturity, naivete, uh, something of that sort. But it's exactly the opposite. He knows who God is. He understands what God's capable of doing. He knows the history of Israel in the covenants with God and what God has done through men before him in what they faced in various armies. I mean, he's just operating off of an abiding knowledge of who God is and what he said. More importantly, it shows that David's already thinking that he can defeat Goliath. You don't ask this question about the reward unless you're seriously considering taking up the challenge, right? So he's a young boy already ready to go into battle. He's just trying to make sure he heard the deal right. His confidence, it is boasting in the Lord. That's what he's doing. He says, this Philistine is bringing reproach upon Israel. Reproach is the word for shame or disapproval before an audience of some kind. So he knows Israel is suffering shame before the nations, in this case, the Gentiles, because of the armies, Israel's armies, seeming impotence, and by association, God's appearing to be impotent against these armies. And that's not something God's going to suffer very long, and David knows that. He knows that they're in covenant with this living God. And when you're into a covenant, a covenant means you pledge your life to the defense of the other. So, literally, God is prepared to give his life for Israel, which he does eventually in the Messiah. But in the meantime, if Israel is attacked by Gentiles, God is obligated by his own word to defend Israel. Now, how he chooses to do that varies according to God's purpose for what's good for Israel. And there are times when allowing the attack to go to a certain extent, as with Nebuchadnezzar, for example, serves God's good purposes for Israel. But he's never going to let them be destroyed. He's never going to let an enemy fully triumph in that sense. He's only going to allow a measure of success when it suits him. And David is working on the assumption that this isn't one of those times, that if God were to work through him, he'll do what is necessary to stop this army. And so David asks about the reward again. The men around him say, no, it's exactly what you heard. And... Then as he asks these questions, his brothers, who are still nearby, hear them and begin to get upset, probably as they're eating the sandwiches. Verse 28. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, What have I done now? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. It's a very interesting exchange here. It kind of shows you the family situation of David, but David's oldest brother, Eliab, it says, burns with anger because of what he's hearing David ask, and he chastises his brother for asking these questions. And what he accuses David of doing, essentially, is, and notice the words he chooses, abandoning his post with... Those few sheep in the wilderness, which implies a couple of things. First, it's demeaning because it's demeaning David on the side of the other soldiers, primarily because shepherding was a role for children. So it's like saying to someone, did you leave your Fisher Price toys at home? It's it's implying you're a child. You have no business here with men. And the whole thing is made worse by saying it's just a few sheep. You know, we don't trust you with too many of them. You left your one sheep at home to come talk to us. And then he goes a step further and he accuses his brother of insolence. And wickedness. Now, insolence is a word that means not showing respect where it's deserved. So presumably, Eliad's still smarting over Samuel's selection of the youngest in the family rather than him for the anointing of God. And secondly, in this case, he says that he is wicked, meaning he is sinful, obviously. I find it interesting that he says that because it's often the case that the sin that someone believes he sees in another is actually an accurate assessment of himself. You know, the thing we always find most irritating about someone else is what we do. And this is, I think, an example of that in which this person, Eliab, is a wicked man, does not know the Lord. He was obviously passed over for good reason. He's jealous of his brother. He's determined to put his brother down. And that's typically something you see in the sinful hearts of people. They'll feel better about themselves if they can make someone else lower. And that's what he's doing here. Everything he says is the opposite of the truth. Demonstrably so. David is innocent. And in turn, Eliab is the one who's wicked and disrespectful, if you noticed. David asks legitimately, what have I done? I just asked a question. David's being a little naive here, if not intentionally obtuse. 
Because he should have known that when he asked the question that he did, he was pouring salt in the wound of this army. This army has sat for 40 days now, having their manhood trampled on by a man who stood out and mocked them every day because no one was brave enough to come fight this guy, right? Now you have what is probably some kid in his mid-teens showing up with cheese sandwiches and nothing else, saying, that's all we got to do is beat this guy? Well, come on, why haven't we done this already? He's acting as if this is a no-brainer, which also then implies that this whole army are a bunch of cowards for not having gone out, which is not actually inaccurate, but it's probably not the most diplomatic thing you could say when you're surrounded by a bunch of men with spears. So it, it may have had a tone of disrespect to them. I don't think it was meant that way. David's talking in pure adoration of the Lord and his power. But the point is, it explains a little more why his brother would have reacted in such a snappy way. I mean, after you've been stepped on over 40 days, your nerves are raw. You know? So he got a little upset. I don't think David is calling these men cowards. But what he is doing, whether he intended to or not, is he's pointing out their lack of faith. David's confidence here comes from having a heart after God. One that God placed in David so that he would glorify the Lord with his life. And the result of that is David knows God's power, God's promises, and God's desire to glorify himself under these kinds of impossible circumstances. He knows the story of Exodus. He knows the story of Joshua coming into the land. He knows the accounts of the judges. And so he's just expecting God to do what God commonly has been seen to do in Israel when these sorts of things crop up. So he's just asking to be sure he understands the terms because it's not been the case typically that God had been willing to reward someone so richly for simply going through into battle. This is not typical. And David's a little surprised that there's such a big price available for him if he just does the obvious thing. So he's one of these guys that just speaks the obvious that's in his heart without any thought at all about how it's going to be taken because he's just the thoughts are running through his head. That's how I interpret the moment. So David's interest in obtaining Saul's reward catches everyone's attention and the word gets back to Saul. And I have to think, by the way, that the troops may have felt a little bit insulted, but they're far more interested in having someone go fight that battle for them than having to do it themselves. So whatever resentment they might have had for David is quickly gone when they think, oh, David might do this for us. Great. They send word back to Saul and Saul is interested in anyone who's willing to take up the challenge. So verse 31, when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fall on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go fight against this Philistine, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. (laughs) So Saul hears that David is visiting and wishing to claim the reward, so he summons him, right? And he enters the king's presence. Notice that David speaks first here. And this is an interesting comparison to earlier in the book, remember, when it would always be Saul who would speak first to Samuel in an attempt to defend his sinful actions. Now you see a king uh, in the making speaking up again, but now with an attitude of, of respect for the Lord and a desire to defend him. And he says, have no fear, underdog is here. In fact, I doubt David's pronouncement would have been any less convincing if he actually had said that and been wearing the outfit. Because it was just as incredible to Saul that he could have gone in and done what he was claiming to do. He says, there's no way you can do this. Saul loses all heart, I think, at seeing David show up. He was hoping perhaps someone bigger was coming. He says, you're not going to do it. You're a child. He's a warrior. This isn't even a close fight. Now, Saul is obviously thinking in, in human terms. How appropriate that the man who was chosen based on how he looked would think about how everything works based on what he can see. This is his pattern at every turn. He moves from relying on the Lord in the very earliest days that we know him in the book to relying on his own flesh. Later in the story of Saul, as he goes down the path and gets worse and worse, he'll move away further from the Lord. He moves from relying on his flesh to relying on cultic demonic power to achieve things that he wants to achieve. So the Lord knew this moment was going to come. So he has prepared David in past experiences to have the things he needs for this moment. And so he tells Saul the story so that Saul will let him go. I battle lions, I battle bears, 
By the way, lions and bears were still indigenous to Palestine in this time. And a lion being a carnivore and a bear being an omnivore, sheep looked pretty good. And so they would often put them on the menu. And once when a lion or bear would come to attack, David said he would beat the animal off or he would grab it by the mane and he would kill him. And if you imagine this in your head, it's hard to imagine a young boy being able to do this task, obviously, without some kind of supernatural intervention. And that's why David credits God with the victories in this case, because that's his point. David is very careful in how he presents it. He says, my proof to you that I can go do this is that I've taken on impossible odds and won, which can only tell you God's on my side. So if I go into this battle, God will be on my side. That was his basic argument. Goliath is just another predator threatening God's flock. I can kill those predators, I can kill this one. Should this story have been reversed somehow, you could have imagined Saul giving a similar story, only who would have been the star of the show at the end of his story? It would have been himself, right? The story, though, sheds some more light on David than, than anything else. It sheds light on how his relationship and his understanding of the Lord developed in his younger years. Because as you read with us last week in the Psalms that David wrote, David said he was prepared by the Lord from birth with this special heart to know the Lord. It's clear that the Lord's been preparing David in a special way. David is not your average saint in the Bible. Not just in what he achieved, but in what God had prepared him to achieve. And when you look at this particular experience of what he did as a child with lions and bear, I mean, take it out of the coloring book for a moment. Imagine the animals you see in zoos. Imagine them loose in a field, and you have two choices as a shepherd. You can say, oh, one less sheep today while I hide behind this tree. Or you rush into a fight with a bear or a lion when you're 12. Any normal preteen would have fled in terror from that scenario, right? He engages in a battle like that in confidence, not just once, at least twice, and who knows how many times altogether. That's a man who has a very special understanding of God and of God's power in his life. Not presumptuously so. I'm not saying all of us have that potential. I'm saying he knew where God had put him and what God was prepared to do with him, even if he didn't know where it was headed. That tells us something about who David was at this young age. When David wrote, reflecting back on his life a little in Psalm 138, he wrote this, I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing praises to you before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word according to all your name. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. And they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly and the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hands. So this is reflective of the confidence David lived with. And it's evident from what he did throughout his life, how he wrote the Psalms, which spanned ten years of his life, and then obviously the times he spent around that. It's clear that he always had that expectation that the Lord was with him and the Lord could work great things through him and that he could depend on the Lord, even if at times he wavered as every sinful man will. Nonetheless, he was unique, and it's this confidence that drives him. In the Psalms, you see it, and now in the face of Goliath, he gives this account. And so Saul says, well, you know what? The Lord be with you. I don't know that he said it with great earnestness, but he sent him on nonetheless. Saul does not have the kind of walk with the Lord that David does. We know that. So therefore, he's not capable, I think, of seeing the supernatural potential of what's going to happen. I don't think he's sending David into battle with the confidence that Goliath is going to be defeated. I think he's chalking this up as one less kid who can play music. And we'll move on to the next battle after this. Maybe it can turn to good for me in some way. But because he doesn't believe in the supernatural, or doesn't give any room for it, what do you think Saul is going to do next after he tells David he can go into battle? Well, he does what someone who lives in the flesh would do under these circumstances. Verse 38. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. This is a somewhat comical moment, if you can imagine it. Saul attempting to dress David in battle garments and all the rest. Now, you remember Saul's height, right? And David's a child still, or <clears throat> not fully grown. So you've got to imagine David swimming 
in Saul's equipment and his armor, right? I mean, it's, it's like a kid playing dress-up in Dad's closet. I don't even know what Saul was thinking. Robert Gordon wrote a book, and he had the comment that Saul tried to turn David into an armadillo. I think that's probably right, right? You, you can't move, but at least he won't be able to get you inside there, you know? And so he's actually handicapped David's movements in battle. So out of respect for the king, David explains his desire to put aside all this stuff by saying, well, I I haven't tested these yet in battle. He doesn't want to wear this ridiculous outfit, but he doesn't want to tell the king that he's refusing the king's gift because the king just gave him his armor, right? You don't want to turn that away without saying something. So he said they're not tested. It's a polite way of saying they don't fit. So instead of sword or armor, what he goes to battle with is something that he had tested well, a sling and a few stones. And no doubt David traveled with his sling everywhere because it was the primary weapon of defense for shepherds. He collects, we're told, five smooth stones. On the side that the Israelites are camped, on the mountainside they are on, they are on the side that the river runs down. It runs on one side. So David's able to walk down to the base of of the hillside, collect some of these stones. It says five smooth stones. We don't know why he collected five because he only uses one. I suspect he just picked up five because you just want to be careful in case the first one misses. But uh, number five means grace, and it could suggest the Lord's working to grant his favor upon David, that the five shows up for that reason. It's unclear exactly the size of the stones. Most of us assume, you know, small stones like this you find in a riverbed, maybe an inch across or something like that. But archaeologists have studied the slings that were commonly used by shepherds in this period of history, in this part of the world, And they say that the pouches that were used, the size of the stones that were going to fit in those pouches, were more likely the size of baseballs. So we're talking about something more like the fist, is what you would have picked up. And the speed of the stone thrown by one of these slings approached the speed of a big league pitch, about 80 miles an hour or so. So getting hit by one of these stones leaves quite an impression. It's knocking you down hard if he hits you, right? Now let's talk about the sling, because the sling of this day was nothing like what kids get today from Walmart. You know, where you think of something like this. That's, that's not the sling of, of Israel. In David's time, a sling was a long piece of tanned leather that was doubled over with a pouch attached at the fold. And then you'd put a large stone in that pouch. Then the shepherd would hold both ends of that strap in one hand. They'd swing it rapidly to gain speed. And at the right moment, the shepherd releases one of the straps that he's holding, launching the stone at high speed. Experienced shepherds could send stones flying hundreds of feet with great accuracy. They used slings to control the sheep, to scare off predators, or to defend against thieves. No doubt David would have been very accomplished using one of these slings against moving targets at great distance, like, for example, sheep. So hitting a large stationary target at close range, like Goliath, would have been child's play for David. So David goes to battle with what he knows he has, but his confidence is in the Lord. So verse 41, then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy, well, with a handsome appearance. (laughs) The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag, took from it a stone and slung it, and it struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him cutting off his head with it. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So he goes out. They're moving out from the ranks of their respective armies so that they stand distinct from the rest of their army, but they're still some distance apart. At the point where Goliath realizes who he's going to fight, he's insulted by who they've sent out to him. The Jewish army had sent out a young boy to defeat Goliath. Even worse, they'd sent out a pretty boy. 
And that's one of the concerns here, because it tells Goliath this isn't even a warrior. I mean, it'd be one thing if they sent out one of their own, he just happened to be the young guy. But no, this guy's not even a soldier. He doesn't have the look of a guy that's been in bivouac for 40 days. He's not dirty and all the rest. He's a young kid coming in from home with cheese sandwiches. And it's clear that he thinks this is intended as an insult to him, like there won't actually be a battle. He says, do you think I'm a dog that you need to discipline me with a stick? And then Goliath, in his anger at being dismissed so disrespectfully, begins to curse David by the Philistine gods. And he taunts him, look, I'm going to kill you so easily, I'm just going to leave you for food. Now, this is all bravado, of course, but ironically, it's very similar to Saul's perspective in ways. Earthly, fleshly, entirely devoid of any consideration for the God of Israel and his power, right? This is merely a human-to-human assessment of what would happen if two people met under these circumstances. The taunt is important because it offers David an opportunity to respond, and what he says is important in defense of the God of Israel. He begins in verse 45. He says, first of all, who has all the weapons here? Not me. You do. What I have in response, though, is I have the Lord fighting on my side. The Lord of Israel is an army all unto himself. And when you taunt Israel, you taunt the living God as well. And he may not always choose to act against that taunt right away or to the fullest extent, but rest assured he will defend Israel. That's what David is confident of. That is still true today, by the way. Israel remains God's people by covenant. They are disobedient, yes. They are suffering under his judgment for a time due to the sins that they've committed for centuries under the covenant. But in the end, he retains his faithfulness even though they do not show theirs. And so he will defend his people. And if you were to taunt, so to speak, Israel today, you taunt the living God to your own destruction, ultimately. Then David proclaims his confidence that the Lord's about to deliver him into victory because he says, I'm going to remove your head when this is all over. And then the army that you lead is all going to be left for dead to the birds, etc., etc. That statement is a brief summary of David's entire life. He leads a nation of God's people by covenant into battle before the nations of the world so that the world may know the God of Israel. He does it in confidence that the Lord will deliver a victory. He relies on the Spirit. He doesn't do it perfectly, but he brings the people into greatness. He does it so that the assembly of God would understand that it is by Spirit, not by might. He does it knowing that the audience for his work is not just the world, but also Israel itself. In the end, it's David who gives them the city of Jerusalem. It's David who gives them the Temple Mount. Secondly, David, in becoming an example within Israel, gives them courage to do the right thing as well. Thinking in terms of judges, uh, certainly what we've already seen in 1 Samuel, then you know that the culture has now had centuries of really bad leadership. And the result of all those centuries of really bad leadership is centuries of really bad behavior. This also is a period in which the nation has had a complete disregard for God's word. It's not reflected in the words of Samuel or of judges necessarily, but it's implied in the behavior of many of the characters. They lack a complete knowledge of God's word. It's almost like Hezekiah's time when the word of God has gone missing for a while in the knowledge of the people. And as a result, they're not living by something they don't understand. They don't know the God who's revealed in Scripture because they don't know the Scriptures. So they have little regard for the Lord and his ability to save them because they've forgotten for the most part what he's done before. David reverses on both counts. So David is not only the leader after God's heart, but by his example, he brings out the best in the nation of Israel, at least within human limits. Look at his courage. When the Philistine starts running toward him, he starts running toward the Philistine. Total confidence. Takes the first stone out, slings it, hits him in the forehead. It says it sinks in. The sense here is not so much that it penetrates and stays in his head, so much as it just caves in his skull. It knocks him out. Interestingly, what was the penalty in Israel for blaspheming? Stoning. So in this case, Goliath is rightly judged according to God's law. The stone knocks Goliath to the ground, but the stone only knocks him out. It's not what kills him. It may have been a mortal wound. I mean, if we left him there long enough, he might have died. But David doesn't wait to find out. He ends up killing him by cutting off his head with Goliath's own sword. When the Philistines see this result, they flee, which so much for their promise to become slaves of Israel, right? You can't trust a Philistine. David's victory begins a rout for Israel's army, verses 52 to 54. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to Shaharaim, even to Gath and Ekron. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Then David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his weapon in his tent. 
So the Philistines retreat. They run basically east to the two nearest Philistine cities. A lot of them are being killed along the way. Eventually, when they get to the cities, we, you know, the Israelites don't chase them into the cities. That would just be asking for a whole other battle. So they turn around at that point. They've won the battle they wanted to win. And they run back into the valley. They plunder whatever was left in the encampment. David, on the other hand, he takes the head of Goliath, and it says it brings it back to Jerusalem. But the curious thing here is, at this point, it's not in a Jewish city. It's a Jebusite city. David doesn't claim Jerusalem for some time to come until he's king. And at this point in his life, he lived in Bethlehem. So there'd be nothing in Jerusalem for him. It's just a strange town. Samuel, I think, is referring to the later day when David moves into Jerusalem. So in other words, Samuel, when he wrote this, he did it at a point in history after the city had already been claimed by David. So with that hindsight, he simply adds as a kind of footnote here that David took the head and eventually, in other words, it ended up with David in Jerusalem, which is to say David kept Goliath's head as a trophy for a long time. And he also kept Goliath's sword, which later you find out eventually finds its way to Nob, the city of Nob, and ends up there. Next time, we move into the effects of this victory on David's life and on his relationship with Saul. So it's such a great story because we love to see the underdog win. But its real power is in how God uses it now to drive a wedge between these two men. So at the same time that it's giving David the mark of God's approval for his anointing amongst the people, it's also setting up a challenge for Saul in who will have the most power and respect among the people. And that's where God wants this challenge to go. So we'll come back after the break, after the holiday break. We'll pick up there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for David, for his courage, for his faith. Father, it's uh, going to be amazing when we meet this man in heaven and we have a chance to have a conversation with him. I'm sure there'll be a long line. And, uh, Father, so many people will, will want to hear the heart of a man who was made to have a heart after you. Uh, Lord, we look forward to, to that day. In the meantime, Father, we take from the scriptures what you intended. And that is, Father, the lesson that uh, there's so much we can do when we look to you for the power that's required and when we lean on you for the guidance and the courage that's needed. Uh, Father, let us always see this world as you do, as a world that does not war with flesh and blood, Father, but is at war with an enemy that cannot be seen, but his effects are everywhere, Father. And we, we pray that you give us boldness to go into that battle, to seek those who are lost and to represent you to the world who needs to know you, not in doing it, Father, with uh, bravado, but doing it, Father, in meekness, knowing it is you who does the work. We just want to have the courage to step in faith, Father, to, to do as you call us to do. Thank you for this season. Give us peace and joy as the season is intended to mark and bring us back here, Father, to study more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.